Hi, I'm Martin Rasser, Senior Fellow with the Technology and National Security Program at the Center for New American Security. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this launch event for the report Common Code. This report is the culmination of a four-month effort to create an alliance framework for technology policy. The project was a partnership between CNAS, the Mercator Institute for China Studies, and the Asia Pacific Initiative, and made possible with a grant from Schmidt Futures. With this effort, we set out to lay the foundation for proactive, broad-based collaboration on tech policy by the world's leading democracies. No existing grouping is equipped to navigate these waters. That is why we call for a new one to be created, a technology-focused, minilateral, focused on regaining the initiative in the global technology competition, protecting and preserving key areas of competitive technological advantage, and promoting collective norms and values around the use of emerging technologies. The report Common Code is the blueprint for what such a grouping should look like, how it should function, and what it should do. We've had lots of good discussions with leaders in government and industry this year, and I'm very encouraged by the traction that this and similar concepts are gaining. We have a tremendous lineup of speakers today. Each will bring their own perspective on the need for greater cooperation, between the world's liberal democracies on tech policy. And we want to hear from you as well. Throughout the program, you can tweet your comments using the hashtag CNES2020. Following the keynote and during the panel discussion, you also have the opportunity to, to ask questions. There are two ways to do so. You can tweet your question using the hashtag CNES2020, or if you prefer, email your question to mlamberth at cnas.org. All right, let's dive right in. Up first is Richard Fontaine, CEO of CNES. Richard, together with Jared Cohen, is the author of Uniting the Techno Democracies, published in the current edition of Foreign Affairs. They lay out their vision for what they are calling a T12. This is a very good and insightful article, so please check it out if you haven't already had the chance. Richard, great to have you with us. Thanks, Martin, for introducing the event. And thanks to you and Ainiki Rikunan and the team for the visionary work that you guys have been doing uh, together with the partners that you mentioned on this need for an alliance of democratic powers to coordinate technology policy. You know, as we approach a presidential election, it's sometimes hard to think of big ideas that could take root regardless of whether it's Trump two or Biden one. And I think uh, an alliance of tech democracies is actually one of those big ideas that can take root uh, irrespective of who wins on November 3rd. And the reason for that stems directly from the way our world has shifted in recent years. It's widely recognized today that the United States faces an indefinite period of great power rivalry with China as the most challenging actor. The global pandemic fallouts generating geopolitical consequences. Uh, each day seems to bring news of tensions between the United States and China across various spheres, ranging from economics and military to diplomatic and ideological. Um, and what's clear is that technology is at the core of this competition. And that as a result, concerns over trade, supply chains, economic dependencies, cybersecurity, data flows. These have all taken on new meaning and urgency today uh, than they did just a couple of years ago. It's also clear that the geopolitical competition has dimensions beyond simply the United States on one side, China on the other. And thus we see today various proposals for groupings of democratic countries that can coordinate their efforts in one domain or across all of them. So the United Kingdom has called for a Democracy 10. The Trump administration has unveiled a clean network initiative. Candidate Joe Biden says that if he's elected, he'll convene a summit of the world's democratic leaders. Um, as Martin mentioned in the current issue of Foreign Affairs, uh, my co-author Jared Cohen and I propose the creation of a T12 grouping to harmonize approaches to technology policy. And these and the other ideas that are out there like them show just how salient this notion is now of combining the power of democratic states, irrespective of who the next president of the United States is or who may be in power uh, in partner countries. And thus the work that Martin and his colleagues on the research done here 
uh, research team have done here is critical. And in their report, the one that we're going to be discussing today, they lay out an alliance framework for democratic technology policy. They offer a specific agenda uh, for that uh, group. They discuss how it might be structured and they illuminate some of the choices and some of the trade-offs that would be involved as we uh, go about doing this. You know, the work that they've done takes place against the backdrop of rising stakes. What's in question today is the ability to shape a technological future as liberal democracies would like, and that's consonant with our values and our interests. Um, the fact that the world's democracies are not competing effect effectively um, particularly well, they're, they're largely disjointed and reactive, and that the status quo is on a bad trajectory. Um, we may be faced with a future where liberal democracies have to compromise their goals or their values and maybe even some of their sovereignty in order to get by. And against that backdrop, I think Martin and the team and our partners have very rightly issued a bit of a call to action here, saying it's time to regain the initiative, uh, put together a group of countries that can share information, that can harmonize policies, that can coordinate responses to third country actions, that can build norms and standards and do more. Um, you know, there are different takes on some of the details associated with how to do this um, among the authors of the report, among the kinds of things that you see in different kind of iterations of this in print and so forth. But um, the the key thing is to be able to, to see the need for this and get the discussion going about what something like this might actually look like. Who would make for the best charter members of a grouping at the outset? What order would we, we wanna tackle some of these key technology policy issues um, how would tech leading democracies work together in order to shape a technological future uh, that is consonant with each of their national interests and with our shared national values? Um, you know, the, the, the report lays out this priority agenda. And again, the details are kind of up for some discussion and debate. Um, but it seems clear that a straightforward and pragmatic agenda would include information sharing, remapping supply chains, setting norms for how technology should and how it shouldn't be used, uh, including agreeing to multilateral export controls, to sanctions to uphold key norms, you know, uh, more ambitiously, even investment coordination on supply chain resilience, uh, joint R&D and things like that. It's important um, as the authors of the report have done it, to think ahead about what some of the objections of some of this might be. Uh, you could say that, you know, we don't need a new group. We've got lots of international groupings, alliance frameworks and stuff like that. The existing ones are sufficient. You could say there's not enough like-mindedness between key countries on issues like data privacy or freedom of speech. There's kind of more that divides us than unites us. Um, or that creating a grouping that's explicitly linking together democratic countries would be provocative, provoke aut autocracies through uh, an exclusivity. And it's worth discussing all of these kinds of objections. I believe ultimately they fall short. You know, the stakes today, the need to do better in this crucial domain of geopolitical competition and the priority that I believe we need to place on democratic harmonization and that many countries are now emphasizing all suggest that the time to begin on such a major project is now. And so to that end, the report that Martin and the team have published will represent, uh, I believe a really invaluable blueprint uh, for the way ahead, um, worthy of debate and discussion and the conversation that we will have today. So um, thanks for the, the time to uh, make a few remarks on that. And let me turn it back over to Martin uh, to take it from here. Great, thank you so much, Richard. I think your point on the bipartisan momentum behind these ideas is particularly important. That's a, a key issue for our allies to bear in mind as we head into the new year. So up next, we have a brief video of remarks by Akira Amari. Amari's son is a former minister of state for economic and fiscal policy, and is currently a senior legislator in Japan's parliament. He was so kind to share his perspective on the role of a technology alliance in securing our digital future.
こんにちは。衆議院議員の天城明です。私は日本の与党・自民党の経済安全保障政策のチームリーダーを務めています。今回、日米6を代表するシンクタンクによるテクノロジーアライアンスのレポートが発表されたということを大変喜ばしく思っております。ご覧のとおり、現在、世界中がコロナ禍に見舞われ、社会の脆弱性というものが露呈をされたわけであります。そしてそれが今後のデジタルトランスフォーメーションを加速させる原因にもなっているわけです。そしてデジタルトランスフォーメーションという社会インフラを通じて新たな社会インフラを通じてキーテクノロジーが社会に実装されていくわけでありますここで2つの視点で考える必要があろうかと思います一つはデジタル技術による社会インフラのいわば国際標準化、その国際標準化がどういう価値観の上で国際標準として定着をさせていくかという点が一つあります。もう一点目は AI であるとか量子であるとかバイオ等の機微技術がこのデジタルトランスフォーメーションをより進化加速させていくという関係にあるということであります。今、民主主義社会は挑戦を受けているわけであります。権威主義国家の価値観と我々が抱えている伝統的な民主主義の価値観とが対峙しているわけでありますけれども、その価値観に沿ったデジタルトランスフォーメーションが進行していくその,その国際標準化がどういうものであるべきかというぶつかり合いがこれから進んでいくわけであります一方の権威主義によるデジタルトランスフォーメーションは国家監視型資本主義を形成していくわけであります我々の民主主義自由と民主主義を価値観のベースとしたデジタルトランスフォーメーションこのインフラの標準というものは国民主権型の新しい社会インフラだと思われたい国家が国民を監視していくシステムではなくて国民が本当に新しいキーテクノロジーを享受する国民主権型の社会システムになってまいりたいと思うわけでありましてこの2つの考えによる社会インフラの国際標準化争いが熾烈になってくるわけでありますでその社会インフラというものは AI であるとか量子の技術であるとかあるいはバイオとか最先端の機微技術がこのシステムの利便性を加速させていくという関係にあります。残念なことに、その権威主義の意思決定のスピードは、我々民主主義国家の意思決定のスピードをはるかに凌駕をしていきます。だから、えー、監視、国監視型あ資本主義の意思決定の圧倒的に早いわけであります。そういう中で、デジタルトランスフォーメーションによる新しい社会インフラを加速させていくキーテクノロジーこれを考え方を同じ,同じをする価値観を同じをする国々で共同してキーテクノロジーを献身国家よりも早く完成させていく加速させていく。そのことが我々の
デジタル社会の新しいインフラの優位性を確保していくわけでありましてその優位性が国際機関,機関の国際社会の標準化となっていくようにしていかなければならないわけであります今回、えー、3つの国のシンクタンクがあタッグを組んで、えー、テクノロジーアライアンスをのレポートが発表されるわけでありますこれから、えー、今の枠組みにさらに自由民主主義を基本的価値とするグループをどんどん加えていってそして、えー、国民主権に基づいたあ世界のインフラシステムを構築していく、えー、自由民主主義が権威主義の挑戦を受けていますけれども我々の価値観の、えー、に基づいたインフラが、えー、国際標準になっていくそのためには重要なテクノロジーを研修に国家公務よりも早く完成をさせていくということは極めて大事なあの鍵になっていくわけであります、えー、今回のテクノロジーアライアンスが、えー、自由と民主主義法の支配人権アイバシーの尊重こういう価値観を共有するというグループの、えー、国際連携の力とりますようにそして21世紀の新しい社会インフラがそういう価値観に基づいたものとして付設されていくように心から願う次第でありますぜひ Thank you Amari-san As Amari-san pointed out the issue of Setting the norms and standards for emerging technologies is critical, and one where democracies working in concert is particularly important. This is a key theme in common code and an area that we see as being ripe for effective cooperation in the near term. Now, let's turn to the interactive portion of this event. I'll introduce our keynote speaker in just a moment, but I want to let you know now that after the keynote, Kylie Atwood will take over as host. Kylie is the national security correspondent for CNN and formerly a reporter for CBS News. She'll moderate a Q&A session and a panel discussion where you have the opportunity to ask your questions. Simply tweet your question using the hashtag CNES2020 or email mlamberth at cnes.org. It's a distinct honor to introduce our keynote speaker. Marietje Schake is International Policy Director at Stanford University's Cyber Policy Center and International Policy Fellow at Stanford's Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. She's a former member of the European Parliament for the Dutch political party D66. Marietje is a leading voice on matters of technology policy, and I'm delighted that she is with us today. Marietje, welcome to CNAS. Thank you so much, Martin. And it's nice to hear the proper pronunciation of my Dutch name for once. So that's a bonus point. Thank you so much. Um, and welcome, everybody. I really, really appreciate the invitation because I, I can see this, you know, contour of very common thinking emerging. And it's, it's very exciting to me. So uh, what I thought I would do is to, to just kick off with a few thoughts. But I, I truly look forward most to the interaction. So I'll be brief. Um, Going back a little bit to my work as a member of European Parliament, but really also now that I work at Stanford, I'm very much motivated by striving to ensure more rights for more people. And that is an increasingly uh, challenging agenda in the times that we live in. Um, I personally went from hoping that the promising words of tech pioneers would actually lead to a prioritizing of freedom and rights to appreciating that despite those big words and hopes, um, it didn't materialize. And we find ourselves at a very, very challenging moment where democracy globally, and also increasingly within our democratic societies is under growing pressure. And so it becomes even more essential and urgent to safeguard democratic principles in relatively new domains like the digital world. Um, Having said that, uh, I can't underline the urgency enough, but it's also clear that there is a huge backlog when it comes to governance and rule setting that I can only hope will be overcome still. The 
more the asymmetry between corporate power and democratic governments continues, the more I find it astonishing how democratic leaders have thus far failed to actually appreciate the high stakes of tech governance. Because democracies were in an advantaged position, uh, one as guardians of an international rules-based order, uh, and also when it comes to uh, their relative advantage when it comes to the tech itself, uh, especially the United States with Silicon Valley was really in an excellent position to be the first mover when it came to initiating rules of governance to preserve democracy in the digital world. But because of the prevalence of a more libertarian model that is so typical for Silicon Valley uh, even today, a precious decade has passed or a couple of decades have passed relatively unused. And I think they gave way, this, this time without much initiative from the democracies gave way to roughly two alternative models of governance. One, um, the private governance model, which is prevalent in democratic nations, and two, the authoritarian governance model, which has been referenced um, earlier today, which of course instrumentalizes technology for control and power. And the fact that that's happening should really not surprise anyone. I mean, uh, we, we would not have even dreamt of regimes that um, always try to consolidate their own position and their top-down grip first and foremost to suddenly act differently when it came to technology. And the rollout of this authoritarian model is increasingly a global battle as well, where a number of countries that are yet undecided may be persuaded by um, taking on products from uh, more authoritarian countries or more democratic countries or uh, looking for inspiration when it comes to legal models, for example, for uh, data protection or rather more uh, national security inspired uh, top down control efforts to use technology uh, as well. So there is a fierce global competition where I think democratic governments are um, risking to be pushed out of the equation. And it's important that democracies catch up. Now, I believe that domestic laws um, are still extremely important. Privacy protection, antitrust um, enforcement, the preservation of uh, electoral integrity, democratic resilience, um, for example, updating election laws when it comes to the role that tech plays and making sure that it's secure, um, fighting disinformation and, and foreign intervention, the whole list of topics that is now so prominent in the United States with less than two weeks to go for the, before the elections, but also issues like non-discrimination or updating media laws, funding innovation, research and science, et cetera. There's a whole host of issues that countries need to work on within their own borders. But clearly, and I think that's the central theme today, international cooperation is essential. And um, I'll get into uh, reflections on the uh, CNAS report in a second. Um, but where we agree for sure is that the momentum to change the status quo is now. Um, I believe that maintaining it, so basically keeping this more hands-off approach on the part of democratic governments and giving an outsized role to the private sector will continue to have a number of harmful effects, including touching on the very essence of the role of the state. Um, I could list a number of areas where private companies essentially are dominant in decision-making and governance, but we could also turn it around and wonder in what areas can democratic governments still effectively manage without bringing tech companies on board. The dependence is extraordinary. Um, anything from building critical infrastructure that involves data to defending it, but also creating offensive capabilities that is now mostly in the hands of private companies, the entire artificial intelligence domain, but also the more basic systems to govern tax databases, social benefits and electoral registers. Think about currencies that could now be minted by business people. And with COVID, healthcare and education has all, have also significantly um, increased their reliance on tech connectivity. The information architecture that we all uh, benefit from or use every day is built by advertising companies, uh, critical infrastructure by consultants, and virtual currencies, well, some well-known and other 
less known business persons. In any case, uh, I think beyond trying to identify which sectors are at stake here and uh, the, the power dynamics and, and try to weigh who's, who's more powerful where, it's, it's also touching, touching upon the more philosophical, principled elements of liberal democracy. Um, anything from freedom of choice being under pressure, from micro-targeting, for example, or questions about whether non-discrimination is really enforced in the digital world with bias that creeps into AI systems, whether it's intended or unintended. Um, but also the very idea of justice, when you have the increased use of predictive policing tools or the opacity of algorithms and data that's used, the question is, where does the presumption of innocence stay uh, in that context? And generally, the public good, who safeguards the public good in the digital world? So um, hopefully it's clear by now that I think there is an urgent need for a rebalance uh, towards more agency and a stronger role for democratic governments, which would include more transparency and accountability also for researchers, journalists, lawmakers, so that we can have a more evidence-based discussion as a society in terms of where we should intervene and where we don't have to. Um, in a recent MIT Tech Review article, I also made the case for a stronger international co uh, coalition. So it's interesting to see how similar some of the thinking is uh, also to the uh, CNAS report that's presented today. But there's a difference. Um, I would propose to create a democratic coalition that would develop a democratic governance model of technology, whereas your report focuses more on different coalitions on the basis of their technological capacity. And I think that the fragmentation that this could lead to is something we may want to discuss. In particular, when we look at the role of the European Union, um, I believe it needs to be empowered to act as a global and a geopolitical player. Um, and especially when it comes to topics at the intersection of technology and geopolitics. And so engaging or peeling off individual EU member states could risk undermining a stronger stance. Um, there's also a sort of example that could be glanced from the European Union because it is a project that has experience in balancing state sovereignty and cooperation. Uh, it remains the most active when it comes to regulating technology, whether people like it or not. And of course, there is work to be done when it comes to spanning the gap between its economic policies and the single market and aspirations um, when it comes to addressing national security concerns, which is still done state by state, so 27 different times. But even having said that, in the field of cybersecurity, dual use export controls, foreign direct investment screening, vulnerability disclosure, antitrust, trade policies, a lot of progress has been made in terms of factoring in technological changes in the regulations as they stand. And there are a number of packages on the table, such as the Digital Services Act, which will regulate platforms, a number of legislative initiatives around artificial intelligence, a data policy, et cetera. So a lot is still in the pipeline. Um, the EU is leading in pushing for continuing to invest in multilateralism, which I'm convinced is needed and should be revitalized to more consider and include in its mandates the specifics of technological development. So think of areas like trade, at the World Trade Organization, uh, rules and standards when it comes to behavior in peacetime and during war with the use of, of cyber tools, uh, human rights questions in the digital world, setting standards, et cetera, et cetera. My concern for the EU is definitely that there is not enough focus on growth and that it should act more as a geopolitical player. But by and large, I think there is a number of areas to work with. So to conclude, um, I see a lot of opportunity to cooperate between democratic nations, and I hope that the bloc can essentially be as large as possible between like-minded countries. So that is explicitly looking beyond the transatlantic relation, which I do hope can be repaired uh, in the near future, um, but also including countries like Japan, uh, India, and other like-minded nations. 
So maybe that can be a basis for discussion. Uh, I don't think there's disagreement on the need for a coalition, but more question about what exact kind of characteristics should bind members of the coalition and how can we organize for it. Uh, I really look forward to your questions. Thank you for your time and having me. Great, thank you so much, Marietje. Um, so Kylie is uh, is running a little late, so I'll just jump in with uh, with a few questions. Um, so uh, first, what I wanted to touch on was your point with uh, the the EU. Uh, so, so we did, uh, as part of our framework, uh, have the EU as a core member, but not a a voting member. And part of the the reasoning behind that was um, you j being able to still have uh, this tech alliance be able to be nimble in terms of its decision making. How do you envision working with an, an organization like the EU, where you have 27 members all with an individual voice, and still be able to um, not get bogged down into uh, in, in the bureaucracy, uh, particularly in areas where, for instance, uh, you know the the issues you mentioned. There's still a fair amount of divergence between the EU and the United States on matters of data governance and so forth. Can you talk a little bit about what your vision for this uh, alliance of democracies would look like, in particular when it comes to bridging those gaps in understanding and um, just the more the bureaucratic considerations of the functioning of such an entity? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, for the EU, I think. The bureaucracy is relative because a lot of standards or rules are already shared within the EU. Um, and it depends, I guess, on whether you enter the conversation from the tech policy angle or from the national security angle. Uh, when you start the discussion with national security, it's true that, that in principle, each and every member state still has its own national security policy. but the pressure on changing that is increasing. We saw that with questions about Huawei and whether it is safe to use. Um, in principle, any company should be able to operate on the European single market on the basis of one set of rules, the so-called level playing field. But effectively invoking national security concerns is a member state prerogative. And so an ad hoc set of principles was developed to better deal with similar questions. And my sense is that the pressure coming from the new realities that technologies bring could be so significant that this could actually accelerate the tempo within which the EU starts to bridge some of those gaps. And even if some of those gaps would remain, when it comes to market policies and tech policies, increasingly they are applicable to all 27. And I believe that scaling to the maximum critical mass is important. One, to have you know, the, the most impact between democratic countries. For example, if there could be common trade rules or rules on the free flow of data, it would create a much more significant space for cooperation than what exists today. But also to have political leverage, the leverage of scale vis-a-vis -vis tech companies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's important in light of the global competition where, as I mentioned briefly, democracies are already finding themselves under pressure. So big cooperative um, coalitions are probably a logical step. Um, and I would imagine that a set of priorities would be identified and that on the basis of that, countries could start working together. Um, the alternative of having a smaller, more agile group of countries is that they might agree, but they do not reach the scale that would be needed to have a global impact. So no doubt it's a balancing act, but my my hope and also expectation is, is that the urgency of, of, you know, what losing agency means and how quickly the technologies force upon everyone's agenda, new questions about standards and oversight and principles could achieve. So I think that the the change can come fast, even if it's not always intrinsically motivated. Uh, those are great points. Thank you. Yeah, you know, one thing I I want to emphasize, um, you know, for for everyone uh, that's joining us today is, you know, this report also is not intended to be, you know, chiseled in stone. Right. This is uh, really the 
starting point of a, of a conversation just like we're having today where obviously we make a lot of recommendations but that doesn't mean we're dogmatically sticking to everything because you know, people will disagree on on points like this and people have ideas that we may not have thought of and and so you know this is a great example of how I want this document to serve as as the starting point for good discussion on these matters because they're so important and to your point they're very urgent so um yeah point well taken um we've uh, have a few questions coming in uh, via twitter right now so let me uh, let me turn to one of these um and this question is regarding the role of private companies um so the role of private companies is significant uh, what is the role of governments given the power differential between slow moving bureaucracies and private actors who can move quickly and um, make the tech that governments want? And I think this touches on um, some of the points you raised in your uh, tech review article, right? Where you're talking about this, um, this gap uh, between um, power and accountability between the private sector and the public sector. Um, so let's address that that Twitter comment. And can you then also talk a little bit specifically about the, uh, the types of actions that this uh, Alliance of Democracies, this coalition that you call for would take in response to the, the issue that, that our viewer raised? Yeah, thank you so much. And first, let me also stress how much I welcome the report. So even if I don't 100% agree, I think it's a really good starting point for discussion. And I think by and large, there is a growing coalition of people who think that this is a path forward. So, you know, it's it's a great basis for, for discussion. And maybe more people will agree with your report than um, than uh, I would imagine. But it's a great start, uh, I think. So congratulations on all the hard work. It has a lot of practical points, which I also think are wonderful. Um, jumping to the question that was raised on Twitter. Um, it's It's been a long term challenge that policy is usually reactive. Um, it's hardly ever proactive because really you don't want to intervene unless there is a problem. And a problem can only emerge once it has you know, proven itself to be a challenge. But it's true that technology is specific here because the tempo of change is significant. And I do think it requires adjustments on the part of lawmaking. And where I see a great opportunity is to have more principle based regulation with enforcement capacities in the hands of regulators. So let's let's take the antitrust model. Antitrust rules are relatively simple, can't form a cartel, can't make price uh, agreements or price discrimination can't become a monopolist and certain mergers and acquisitions have to be assessed before they can go through in light of the other principles. But it's a, it's a fairly straightforward set of principles and it is then up to the mandated regulator to assess whether these principles are at stake. And it doesn't matter whether it is milk producers, truck producers, search engines, phone makers, you know, pharma, Whoever violates these rules um, or whenever there's an allegation of such violations, a lot of information can be inquired, a lot of research can be done. And if violations of antitrust rules or competition rules are found, significant sanctions are taken. Now, I think it's high time to update antitrust rules, but principally the idea that you have a number of agreements on what is not allowed and you could also imagine that, for example, discrimination is one of those principles, then empower the regulator to inquire with the proper technological skills and mandates, whether that principle is at stake, whether it's you know in a hotel or on a hotel booking site, discrimination should not be allowed. And so making more principle-based regulations and having a more adaptive uh, inquiry into whether the principle is respected should make it more um, technology proof in the sense that you don't have to update for every relatively small change in the technological specificities. Uh, and that's important because we've seen with, for example, copyright protection laws that um, initially, for example, the, the, the articulation of the law was around illegal downloading, but by the time the law process was finalized, people were already streaming, right? And so technically speaking, 
the law would be outdated and that's something that you want to prevent. Great, excellent, thank you. Uh, we have uh, another question from, uh, from Twitter. Um, this person would like to know, uh, can you talk a little bit about the role you see for civil society in developing norms and democratic frameworks? And, and how do you see new organizations uh, such as NGOs uh, factoring into the equation and not just leaving these discussions to an interplay between regulators, governments, and international organizations? So I think that the role of civil society organizations is crucial. It's also uh, a kind of role and, and uh, facilitating of civil society that sets democratic societies apart from any other societies. It's not a coincidence that in many non-democratic societies, civil society organizations struggle, are under pressure, are banned. Uh, so I would say that democracy is a multi-stakeholder process and it's something we should not forget just because in the internet governance context, so often people are pushing for multi-stakeholder models. And I think democracy as such is a multi-stakeholder model. So the role of civil society to the extent that this is their focus, tech rights, civil liberties, uh, privacy protection, cybersecurity, et cetera, I think is significant. And hopefully there's an almost parallel shared agenda in the sense that if democracy suffers, civil society suffers. So um, I've always benefited a great deal from the expertise of civil society organizations, not only in uh, asking for certain changes, but also highlighting the very human stories of what is at stake. I think too often the technological is abstract, is um, technical, is hard to understand. And if we wanna change the political momentum, it has to become more of a human story. And I think digital is already human, but this is where civil society organizations can highlight, you know, what is the impact of a cyber attack on a hospital on the patient or the hacking of a human rights defender's device on the person that is trying to do his journalistic uh, work in difficult circumstances or protect women's rights or whatnot. So. Uh, sharing stories, making what's at stake real and representing the various people that this organization cares about, I think are all extremely important. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I'm told that, uh, that Kylie Atwood has joined us now. So let me turn it over to her uh, for a few more questions and uh, then we'll head over to the panel in a bit. Welcome, Kylie. Thank you. Hi, guys. Sorry, I was late. Um, Mariche, I um, want to throw a real life um, example at you that we've seen here in the U.S. media um, over the last few weeks. And, um, you know, just get your thoughts on, on how to tackle an issue like this, because you've been obviously studying it um, for so long. So, um, you know, in the past few weeks, there was the New York Post story about these alleged Hunter Biden emails um, from his laptop different technology platforms here in the U.S. dealt with that story in different ways. Now, at CNN, we weren't able to authenticate it, so we didn't deal with it in the same way that, you know, Twitter um, and Facebook dealt with it. But how do you see a future possible technology alliance, you know, an effort here with multiple countries regulating something like this and how these independent private tech companies would handle this kind of uh, disinformation? Yeah, I think it's a crucial question that, that doesn't only speak to the power of tech platforms, but also to the responsibility of more traditional media like a newspaper or a television uh, broadcaster, right? Because the yeah. publication did not start with social media, but it started with a newspaper. Uh, and the question of unverified claims is, is one that has had to be dealt with irrespective of technology. And uh, I do think there is some opportunity in looking at how media laws and media ethics and media principles can apply more broadly. The whole exemption of responsibility that social media platforms have enjoyed through Section 230, I do think is challenged also by their own decisions, right? I mean, it's not like they're not intervening. Tech platforms are curating content constantly on the basis of commercial motives, um, maybe under pressure to remove hateful content or violent, violent speech or whatnot. 
But the whole idea that they are neutral uh, and just a platform, I think, is an outdated thought that has big impact, not only in the United States, where the First Amendment is a very, very powerful legal principle, but a lot of countries around the world do not have the First Amendment, right? And in a lot of countries, disinformation about someone can actually lead to immediate violence and, and worse. So stepping back for a moment and asking what we could do with, with a coalition that's based on democracy, I would like to see the lead being taken on where the limits of free speech lie and where harm should be prevented. I would like to see the initiative of def definitions and exemptions with dem democratically accountable leaders and not by commercial advertising platforms. So that's a general um, principle that I think would be better for safeguarding um, very, very important aspects of freedom of expression and protection of people. So um, in an ideal wor world, this coalition of democracies would have similar definitions and standards, but certainly more transparency and accountability on what corporations are doing in this very important space that touches on universal human rights would be really, really needed right now. So that it's not just ad hoc decisions with self-made reports on how performance against these principles is doing, such as what the tech platforms are doing, right? They say, mm -hmm. we are now removing 90% of fake, fake news within 24 hours. And it's hard to know what that means exactly, what the 10% is that's not being taken down, how it's done by humans or by automation. There are so many questions about the crucial aspects of information architecture and its governance that I think that that in and of itself, the fact that private companies are in the lead and democratic governments are sometimes guessing or incident responding is, is bad in and of itself. So just so I'm clear, so, um you believe that, you know, a technology alliance could and should set the principles, but then it would be um, up to the independent countries themselves to then revisit the laws in their country to actually make sure that there are laws in place that allow those principles to be upheld, uh, you know, in, in everyday citizens' lives in each country? Yeah, I think there should be co coordination on the core principles, but the implementation may be a little bit varied from country to country. And a model for how that works is already existing in the EU. There would be yeah. an agreement on the EU level and then the implementation happens country by country. But primarily, I believe some of these decisions are political ones. When leaders of democratic countries decide this is where we're going to draw a line, that is very important. And then it can be implemented as is necessary within the, the national context. Right. Um, and, and just following up on, you know, this, this conversation about, um, you know, independent countries and, and their decisions. Do you, you've talked about in some of your work, there, there needs to be kind of a norm that pertains to, to everyday, um, use of technology. But do you think that there needs to be, um, separate conversations about how that norm applies to, you know, the lives of everyday citizens and how it applies to how the government um, uses it in the national security space? And what kind of challenges does that present um, for a technology multi-country effort when they're sitting down at the table and trying to develop these norms, but not wanting to share, you know, necessarily um, their trade secrets, their national security um, efforts that have to do with technology. Right. So I think that the example that you point to is very clear in the long standing discussion about who should attribute and how difficult or how hard it is to attribute, for example, who is responsible for a cyber attack. Um, yeah. And here, I think that by building trust within a coalition, more should be possible. Um, and that the urgency of closing the accountability gap, so preventing criminals and state actors from getting away with essentially very, very harmful behavior is very urgent. I mean, sure, it might be hard to share sensitive information and there should be questions about, you know, what is needed to be shared or how much of this is also a political discussion, um, you know, where it's shared in terms of in a confidential setting, uh, experts like certs between themselves or, you know, the, the people who can actually interpret this data and then attaching the consequences. But I think we've come to a point where the urgency to close the accountability gap after 
cyber attacks is so significant that hopefully political will can be um, created through understanding what is at stake also by doing nothing. Right. And, um, you know, as you talk about building this trust and building these uh, principles, um, obviously those countries, you know, as you've cited, you know, like the EU could take collective action to strike back um, against any cyber attack, cyber intrusion. Um, are there any examples that you can think of that demonstrate just how effective, you know, that deterrence is to rogue actors and aggressive regimes like North Korea and like Iran? Well, we can draw an example from traditional sanctions. So sanctions, not in the tech context specifically, but just to deter individuals or their, their governments from specific behavior. So the EU has placed individuals from the Islamic Republic of Iran on the sanction list, uh, which means asset freezes, travel bans, uh, naming and shaming. And I think it's pretty telling that these individuals would challenge they're uh, adding to the sanction list before European court. So I think it shows that they're not quite happy with it then. Um, and generally, I think we we should not only look at what these individuals think, because some of them you know, may just buy villas elsewhere and send their kids to, to other schools. I do think that a number of, of people who travel freely in an international community, you know, go to big sports events. This is all pre-pandemic, of course, but go to big sports events, go shopping in European capitals, send their kids to European universities. Would like to continue doing that. Uh, some of them have holiday homes, you know, they, they want to be seen as belonging to uh, a legitimate group of people. And if they're identified as, as not belonging there, I think it's, it's not great for them. Uh, similarly, when it comes to, for example, the tragic and um, very unnecessary shooting down of MH17. The fact that there's so much hiding of tracks and no, non-cooperation on the part of Russia in this case, leads me to believe that the accountability is not something that they are open to. Um, and so I do think that, that there is a price that people pay. And um, irrespective of what the it's targeted individuals think as a matter of principle, you have to attach consequences to violations of norms and behavior. You cannot just sit by. Right. Um, so, you know, stepping back, I think we have about a minute or two here until we open um, with the, the panel, the folks who have actually written this report. Um, but Marice, if they are successful, you know, if um, the model is adopted, maybe some changes to it, um, but with this technology democratic alliance, what do you see changing um, in 20, 30, 40 years down the road for the better globally? I think in a number of areas, there are currently relatively few rules. So we may intuitively agree that it's not right or not the best way to ban an app ad hoc or to um, to see cyber attacks happening without consequences, but it may well be that the laws are not up to speed yet. Uh, another example is the, the global trade in commercially made surveillance systems. I think a lot of people intuitively feel that it may not be the best idea to have companies at intelligence services level selling top level technologies to whoever wants to buy it. Um, but currently the laws don't prevent it. So I think the improvement that needs to be made is that the laws are updated for the digital era and that there are institutions and mechanisms to enforce. And I think in trade, the dynamics have drastically changed because of digitization and the rules are just not yet there. So there is not a, an enabling environment as illustrated by the ad hoc ban on TikTok that the president of the United States proposed. It's very ad hoc. You could also say, had there been enabling standards, then irrespective of whether a company is from China, from Europe, from Africa, or from Asia, it can just you know, enter the market once it meets certain criteria. And that's the kind of rules that I think we need. Similarly, when it comes to war and peace, to the application of human rights law in the digital world, there is a lot of need for clarification and for the development of ac accountability mechanisms. And if democratic nations would work together better, then in 30 years, 
there would almost be a seamless area when it comes to rules in the digital world between democracies. And I think that that's the best way to create weight and scale vis-a-vis -vis, um, other models, including more authoritarian ones, but also privatized governance models. Right. Um, all right. I have a final question for you from um, someone who's tuning in, in on Twitter. Um, and this person says they're curious if Mauricio thinks EU institutional structure is fit for purpose in dealing with complex trade, tech, security nexus. It's not too siloed in the current structure. If so, how do we fix it? Um, yeah, no, I do think that it's too siloed at the moment, um, as illustrated by the example that I gave earlier, where the EU has a single market, but it has individual decisions on national security concerns, but also on trade and technology. Um, the, the world of trade is relatively traditional. I used to work on trade policy when I was a member of European Parliament and, you know, negotiators work according to what they think are sort of standardized protocols of how to deal with trade in dairy products and, uh, you know, um, telecoms equipment and uh, all kinds of goods and services. But the layer that has come on top is digitization. So it basically went from a lot of trade in goods to the what they call serviceification of trade and now the digitization of trade. And I think it's definitely possible for the EU to update its rules. We in the European Parliament adopted a report, for example, with a large majority, and that's exceptional when it comes to trade policy, which is quite divisive, um, on an agenda for digital trade on the part of the EU, which I think had a lot of helpful pillars to work with in terms of you know, the free flow of data, intellectual property, human rights protection, privacy, data protection, etc. Um, and I hope that the, the facts on the ground, so to say, the fact that there are so many urgent matters where it's important to have an enabling legislative environment instead of ad hoc decisions that at the end of the day, give an advantage to those who want to advance their own plans. So for example, while there's still discussion about whether network equipment from Huawei is safe, Huawei is investing in research, investing in, in telecoms networks, investing in relations with people in Europe. You know, the advantage is definitely there, theirs at the moment that there's not consensus and not clarity. And so with all of this, sure, we can point to bureaucracy and the lack of political will, which I largely agree with. There has just not been enough leadership However, a tipping point may well be on the horizon if we see what's at stake. And I think it's also up to us to push political leaders to do more. Well, there is certainly um, a group of folks who is trying to do that. So um, I really appreciate you having this conversation. I uh, am very sorry that I was late. I was at a press conference at the State Department. Um, but it's it's really um, a pleasure to have you. It's an honor to speak with you. Um, and I think everyone who's been watching has learned a lot. So let's continue to keep this dialogue open um, as we turn it over to the authors um, of this incredible new report, Common Code, an Alliance Framework for Democratic Technology Policy. All right, I see folks coming in. This is fun. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> People Hi, who I know um, by just your names, it's, it's wonderful to see you um, pop up here on the screen. And I just want to introduce, um, we have Martin Rasser. Um, I met Martin just recently. Um, he is a senior fellow in the Technology and National Security Program at the Center for New American Security. He is one of the authors along with Anike Rakonen. I'm sorry if I butchered the pronouncement there. Uh, she is also at the Center for New American um, Security. Down on the bottom here, we've got um, Rebecca Arsanti. Ars Arsanti? Um, she's an analyst <laughs> at um, the Mercator Institute for China Studies. And lastly, we have Shin Oya, um, and Shin is coming to us from the Asia Pacific Initiative, where he is a senior consulting fellow. Um, welcome, everyone. First of all, I mean, 
you guys have put a tremendous amount of work um, into this report and into just exploring all of the possibilities that are out there and trying to synthesize them. So um, those of us who are trying to learn more about this space, I want to say thank you for doing this report. Um, and before we, you know, dig into the specifics of the report, I wonder if one of you would like to give any responses um, to the remarks that we heard from Mariche um, and some things that she said about the report that she would do a little bit differently or that she liked. Um, is there anyone who wants to jump at that before we dive into the report itself? Sure. I mean, I, I think thematically, um, you know, she had mentioned that democratic leaders really need to appreciate the high stakes of technology governance. Um, and she noted that so far policy has been reactive and ad hoc. And so I think, you know, that's right on the money in terms of the things that we were trying to address. Um, you know, how do you make policy not something that's just reactive, but something that's proactive and takes into account um, the consensus of all the countries that, you know, think a little bit the way that we do um, coming from the U.S. perspective? Cool. I love that. Uh, Shin, go ahead. Uh, yes, and um, she mentioned that uh, what is the appropriate size of this uh, that, uh, uh, institution, a uh, new grouping. And actually, this was a very difficult question for us. Uh, if a uh, number is too many, it's very difficult to, uh, for us to find a very good uh, single uh, solution kind of things. So what we think about is uh, outreach is very important. Even though some countries outside of this uh, core group, we think it's still very important for us to outreach and listen, uh, listening to opinion. For example, ASEAN is very important from the viewpoint of Japan. So even though at the first uh, stance, they are not member of this uh, small group, I think outreach is very important, I think. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, so one thing I'd, I'd love to emphasize is that this this core grouping that we're proposing, it's, it's not an exclusive club in the sense that we place heavy emphasis on having there be a mechanism for other countries and other organizations to be able to work with this technology alliance on a whole range of technology policy issues. I mean, the, the reason that we want that core group to remain small, however, is to make sure that decision making and taking action ultimately is as efficient and effective as possible. And that, that's the primary rationale for keeping the size of this core group, um, you, you know, around 10, 11, 12 countries. That's that's ultimately the, the sweet spot, we think, for the, the most effective number of countries to work together on matters like this. Great. Um, so you have kind of um, teed us up for uh, something that I was curious about when I read the report. Um, you do talk about these 10 countries plus the EU um, becoming members of this, you know, Democratic Technology Alliance. Um, and I just would encourage you guys, um, you know, why not use uh, the G7 or some other platform, uh, international body that has already been established? You address this a little bit in the paper. I'm sure that you guys have um, more thoughts as to why you want to create um, this new alliance that's separate from any of these other international bodies. Um, but I'd love to hear more on that thought process. Rebecca, do you want to hop in because we haven't heard from you yet? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Kylie. Thank you so much. And let me emphasize how grateful I am to represent Merix in this project and how excited I am about the report. It's been great to collaborate with API and CNAS on this. Um, on your question, uh, we do survey um, a wide range of international um, multilateral institutions working on several aspects of technology policy. And one thing that uh, we noticed is that there isn't a single forum that is um, equipped to really navigate the challenges of uh, 21st century technology competition. And that's because a lot of the institutions that we see were uh, created before the digital age and they were created um, when the international context was very different. Um, the organization that would resemble uh, what we're proposing um, a bit more is the G7. Problem with the G7 is that uh, it doesn't include some leading uh, technology powers. Um, 
that we propose uh, to include in the technology alliance. Another issue is that uh, it hasn't been that active uh, on technology policy issues so far. Yes, um, we have seen individual countries taking initiatives within the G7, for example, Canada and France, uh, proposing a global partnership on AI, which was done within the G7. But the organization itself is simply not designed a, in a way that uh, allows for um, what we are proposing here, unless it's fundamentally reformed. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think that answers the question. Um, uh, another aspect of just kind of, you know, the the fundamentals um, of how this would look, I think, you know, big picture, um, you guys propose that this is not a treaty, that it is an alliance. Um, why? <laughs> Martin? Well, it's very important, uh, you know, in order to get a, an organization like this off the ground, we wanted it to be as informal and as flexible as possible. Um, a lot of the feedback we received during the workshops that we hosted to discuss these issues, um, we also um, provided a survey to hundreds of uh, leaders in industry and government around the world where the appetite was if you start looking at proposing something like this. And by and large, the feedback we received was that, you know, don't create a formal treaty-based organization with, you know, a physical headquarters and so forth. So start a, a network-based architecture for the organization, keep it informal, and then you start building on that as this new grouping becomes, you know, more effective, right? And so that's why we called this report common code, because we identified uh, a few key areas of technology policy where there was you know, overwhelming consensus that yes, these are the areas that we should focus on. And uh, based on the feedback we received, these were the areas where uh, we believe we can get all these countries that we propose to work together to actually go about and, and start taking concrete action in, in the relative near term. Gotcha. Um, so when you do talk about, you know, the speed of setting it up, and um, I think everyone would agree that there is a need uh, for something like this. I mean, you know, we hear it all the time from lawmakers in Washington. Um, we now hear it on the international stage a lot. Um, you know, technology is without uh, the constraints or the grounding uh, principles that you guys are proposing here. So, you know, say there is a new administration potentially um, who agrees with the ideas that you have laid out broadly. How long do you think it would take to set up this alliance if the U.S. is on board and then other countries, you know, slowly come on board? And then my second question is, I know you guys spent a tremendous amount of time talking to folks and, you know, uh, collecting ideas that helped you inform uh, this report. What was the most surprising thing uh, that you discovered in those conversations? Um, who do we, who wants to take that one? Aniki, I see you smiling. Yes, always smiling. Um, sure, I'm happy to take this one. Um, I mean, I think in timeline, it's an interesting question only because you're already kind of seeing the little sprouts of different countries looking into this and certain, you know, similar initiatives. Um, you had the UK looking at perhaps a D10 um, here in the United States with the State Department. It's been interesting to see sort of the iterative approach the US government has taken from saying, you know, we don't like Huawei versus, oh, actually there are some prog proposals and here's some reasons why. Um, and then really trying to get allies and partners on board. And so I think um, part of the key for a technology alliance, um, somewhat, well, informally, but somewhat more formally, um, is to just kind of stitch these efforts together and, you know, have an actually um, cogent um, and an intentional approach to this. And again, um, looking to create proactive policy um, instead of being just purely reactive. Um, I think for me, one of the surprising things um, sitting in on a number of our workshops um, was to see that in terms of substance, there was a lot of alignment that, you know, we need to have this, it needs to have a value-based proposition. Um, we can no longer do the ad hoc thing, but just in terms of the framing, um, you know, in here in the U.S. government, in Washington and in the US government, um, there's a lot of discussion about what does great power competition look like. Um, I think more broadly with our international partners, there have been more remarks about what does it mean to have a shared future for prosperity. Um, in my mind, just my individual opinion, I think the two are very closely connected. And so we really tried to um, 
bridge those two schools of thought into a more common image. Um, that's awesome. Um, super helpful. Uh, I just, I want to, you know, see if anyone else would like to say anything on that. And I'll just add, um, you know, one additional question. I know you guys talk to, you know, lawmakers, diplomats, um, technology experts. To what degree did you engage with the private sector in your conversations for this report? Um, and, you know, what could you sense about their willingness to be a proponent for this or um, their hesitation and perhaps the fact that they would uh, get you know, become a road bump to uh, pr trying to prevent countries from signing on to anything that would, in effect, uh, put controls potentially on what they're doing. Do you want to go yeah, in uh, or Mar Martin? Go ahead. Yeah, let me uh, touch on that real quick, because um, that's a very important question. Uh, you know, from the outset, we wanted to ensure that all stakeholders were involved in these discussions because uh, particularly in the case of private industry, as you pointed out, you, you know they're going to be directly affected by this on on many many levels. Um, so industry was invited to all the workshops that we did. Uh, we included uh, industry respondents in the survey. We're also going to have follow on discussions in November and December to dig into some of the um, you know more difficult issues because we talk a lot about uh, multilateral export controls, for example. This is something that is going to affect quite a few companies. The broader discussion when you start talking about restructuring supply chains, there's a lot of second and third order consequences that we need to talk through with industry, industry stakeholders in order to really fine tune the recommendations so that they're actionable, but can also be implemented in such a way that we don't harm the competitiveness of, of companies uh, in the Tech Alliance countries. Um, real quick, uh, just to go back on the, the timeline. So I, I've personally sketched out a timeline where, you know, about a year that you could go from, uh, so say, the, you know, the United States takes the initiative to uh, to set something like this up, where the president starts calling his counterparts in these countries to having the first uh, meeting of heads of state uh, to announce this tech alliance and put it into motion. I think that can be done in about a year. A lot of the wow. purpose of this report was to do as much of the upfront work as possible to get over that initial hump of thinking about all the bureaucratic considerations that go into it. So that way you get the discussion going more as to uh, fine tuning the different recommendations and not have to have those initial discussions on everything that needs to be considered. Um, and then finally on the point of what surprised me most was I was very pleasantly surprised by how quickly uh, all the folks that we spoke with coalesced around these five uh, core recommendations that we have in the report, these these top priorities. So it was really heartening to see how much uh, agreement there was that uh, cooperative action in these areas was not only necessary, but also urgent. So, but uh, yeah, I'd love to, uh, to hear what uh, Shin and Rebecca have to say on that point as well. Yeah, go ahead, Chen. Yes, uh, regarding the, the cooperation with uh, private companies, uh, I think our recommend, recommendation has two elements. One is that promoting uh, that, uh, I mean, technology area, so supporting private companies' activity uh, to, for them to become more competitive. And, uh, and uh, another area is protecting uh, this technology. So keeping this includes uh, investment screening and also export control. And this uh, protecting portion, yes, there is a possibility that some companies, uh, it becomes a little bit difficult for them to do business uh, because uh, protection becomes stringent and stringent. But having said that right now, coordination between uh, like-minded countries is not sufficient enough. So one countries uh, that export control uh, suddenly uh, occurs to and affects uh, uh, another country's uh, companies. Therefore, even this fear of a protecting portion, I mean, uh, this kind of a mechanism can benefit uh, individual companies. And of course, uh, in sphere of promotion, 
this can uh, definitely benefit companies. So there is a pro and con from the viewpoint of uh, the, the companies, but I think uh, we listen to many companies and we continue to listen to a company's opinion because they are very important and they are the, the pivotal and the center for the, uh, the democratic and also capitalist countries. Awesome. Um, I want to uh, just dig into the jugular of, of one of your recommendations and then we'll turn to some of the questions that are coming in um, on Twitter. Um, but, you know, if you get to the end of, of the report, there's recommendation 11, which is to codify norms and values for technology use. Um, you know, that is a massive goal. So what exactly um, does this mean? And and could an alliance like this, you know, determine which cyber attacks are continue, uh, considered an act of war by these countries? And do you think that the alliance should adopt a policy of collective de defense, you know, such as like uh, NATO's Article 5? Is, is that something that is on the board here? Um, and what do you guys think about it? Rebecca? Yes, maybe I can comment on the first part of your question on norms and standards, which indeed is something that we emphasize in, in the report. Um, I think what we see um, clearly is that um, the reason why illiberal countries, uh, authoritarian countries can push for certain uses of technology which are not in line with democratic principles. And we make the example of China in the report um, is that uh, China is able to step into, um, into the regulatory um, space for technology because democracies have failed to collectively uh, craft standards and norms for technology, uh, especially emerging technologies like AI and, and how those should be used. Um, we see China being very active in international standard setting bodies like the ITU with proposals, for instance, to regulate facial recognition technology. Um, and because technology goes faster than regulation, uh, what we propose is for democracies to really come together and craft those standards instead to make sure that um, technologies are not used uh, in ways that violate human rights, for example. So that is really a critical point. Yeah, that's great. Um, anyone want to take the collective defense uh, proposition? Chin, go ahead. Uh, yes, <clears throat> on uh, collective defense, I think, of course, Japan and the U.S. has a mutual security agreement, and even cyber attack can be considered as an attack, and uh, this uh, Article 5 can be triggered. But we have, uh, I mean, uh, law, I mean, treaty. <clears throat> now we are discussing this common code and uh, tech alliance, and as uh, Martin mentioned, this is informal and fast sharing information and cooperating uh, regarding uh, investment screen kind of things. So it's a statement uh, we mentioned uh, this is a starting point of uh, collective uh, defense. And uh, this can be harmful for us to say that this is a starting point of uh, collective defense. Of course, we should not uh, exclude any possibility. In future, such kind of things uh, will happen. But uh, at this stage, this is uh, technology sphere, cooperation, and the norm is important. That's my understanding. Understood. Um, all right, I want to turn, unless anyone else has anything to say on that. Are, are we good? A few nods? Okay, great. Um, I want to turn to a question that um, is being uh, proposed to us uh, from Twitter, um, and that's, to what extent do you think the EU's current lag in AI limits limits its future ability to act as a key player in geostrategic technology competition? Martin, you're at the top of the screen, so you've got this one. Sure. Um, well, I think, yeah, Europe's position in artificial intelligence right now, it's its a bit of an obstacle, but, uh, you know, it's definitely not something that uh, is insurmountable either. Um, yes, they'll have less influence uh, over the near term, but Europe has a tremendous amount of potential uh, to do great things in artificial intelligence. And, you know, um, France, for example, was one of the leading voices behind creating the global partnership on AI. Um, so I definitely don't see this as being a, uh, a long-term hindrance. And in fact, uh, by taking this technology 
um, alliance approach, I think Europe in particular is very well positioned to make uh, significant improvements in its digital economy. So I think this tighter uh, collaboration along the lines of what we're proposing will will do a lot for Europe's uh, long-term competitiveness uh, in these technology areas. So um, it's a really great question, um, but uh, yeah, I think I'm a, a bit more uh, optimistic on the outlook for Europe on this front, because again, if you look at the, the human capital and the S&T infrastructure that Europe has in place, and that's a tremendous advantage that it has. Rebecca? Yes, I'd like to jump in here. And I second Martin point. I think um, I'm also more optimistic about the prospects for, for Europe to Europe to play a role in AI because I think uh, that Europe clearly has uh, advantages when it comes to talent, when it comes to basic research, um, really excellent institutions for AI research are located in Europe. Uh, plus, I think uh, Europe itself has realized that it um, was focusing on AI regulation, but not so much on AI development, that there wasn't enough capital um, being injected into AI companies, for example. And this is something that the EU is doing really a tremendous amount of work uh, in addressing. Um, I would point to the latest uh, strategy on AI that the European Commission put out. Uh, which I think is a really good sign that there's a lot of movement um, in Europe to address those weaknesses um, and to make sure that Europe doesn't only research AI, but also develops competitive technologies based on AI. So I'm also optimistic uh, about, about Europe's future in this sense. Right. Um, if I could add here as well, um, I think a question about AI leadership in general is kind of interesting because there's so many constituent parts. Um, as, Rebecca, as Rebecca mentioned, um, there's a human talent part. But I also think um, it's interesting to th see the role Europe is playing in thinking about how we you know, manage data and what those principles look like. Um, here in the US, we kind of have this patchwork approach. And so I think the EU in some ways is playing a leadership role in looking at um, what do the constituent parts of, you know, the things that go into AI um, look like, right? And the other thing I would point out too is thinking more broadly about this question of what does it mean to be a player in geostrategic technology competition? Um, it's not just going to be AI. It's not going to be just 5G or just quantum or any of these, um, you know, critical or emerging technologies. Um, but it's also about how do you go about digital development and how do you work with other states as well? And so, you know, I wouldn't count Europe out just on the basis of this one question of um, advanced AI. Great. Um, so I'm, uh, let's see where, where I want to go with this. Um, you know, when you talk about kind of um, technology development, um, one thing that you guys um, discuss uh, in the report is the need to, you know, jointly invest in R&D and to diversify, diversify supply chains, um, which I think, you know, at the top level, um, you know, most people can agree with that um, in order to compete with what China is doing um, in a lot of ways, of course. Um, but when you get into the nitty gritty there, um, how challenging do you see uh, that actually being um, in practice? Because you're going to have all these countries who are theoretically signing on to, you know, um, a set of technology uh, norms, you know, a common code. Um, but ultimately, they're going to be worried about their bottom line. They're going to want, you know, to do the R&D in their countries. They're going to want um, the supply chains, in many cases, to go through their countries. So how do you guys see um, that tension, that real tension um, playing out? And Martin, maybe you can take that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the, uh, the fundamental arguments that we make in the report is that you know, no one country can go it alone in trying to solve these very difficult, complex issues. And, and there's no question when you're talking about diversifying supply chains, uh, doing you know complex joint R&D. Yeah, it's going to be difficult and it's expensive and it's time consuming, but it's also very necessary and urgent. In terms of um, attacking these problems, uh, you know, there's much more to be gained by working in concert on these issues. Because one thing that we emphasize 
in the report as well is that you know, there's a lot of talk about onshoring everything. There's you know protectionist sentiments. That isn't the answer to the dilemmas that we're facing right now because bringing everything your you know your supply chains back from China, bringing manufacturing back, isn't going to address the fact that you're creating vulnerabilities again by highly concentrating your supply chains in a small geographic area that just shifts the problem to a different part of the world. What we think is a much better solution is to uh, diversify geographically. But in order to do that in a secure and effective way, you have to do that with countries that you can trust. So governments that you know will not arbitrarily cut you off from accessing a manufacturing facility uh, because they have the rule of law in place. And that's why we emphasize the democratic aspect of this alliance so much is because you want like-minded countries that you can work with and rely on in times of need. And I think in particular, if you start thinking about the need to be able to uh, ramp up production of, of certain items in a crisis like we're facing with the current pandemic, that type of resilience only makes economic sense if you can share that burden. So yes, there will be some sacrifices that have to be made in the near term in terms of uh, you know, the, the bottom lines of companies, but we also have a lot of proactive proposals on how this grouping of countries can work together to, to minimize the impact of that. And ultimately you're setting the foundation for much longer term benefits. Um, and so, the, you know, 10, 20 years from now, these countries will be in, in a much stronger position than they are today, particularly if they try and tackle these problems on their own. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so one thing I want to ask you about um, is India. It's mentioned in the report as a country that could potentially join um, the alliance. Um, you guys indicate that they weren't interested in being, you know, an original member of the alliance. Um, at what point do you think they would be interested in joining and what would they have to do in order to become a member? Um, Shin, do you want to take this one? Yes. Yes, uh, the reason I we mentioned that uh, I mean, they are not at this stage starting members, uh, we checked their temperature uh, that uh, informally, uh, it's a match, I think. So situation is uh, changing rapidly. So uh, I think it's possible that in the future, uh, India started to think that uh, this is a very uh, useful element for them. And of course, uh, India has a lot of uh, the talent uh, regarding uh, the, the software and also technology. And also another element is uh, which you asked and Martin uh, responded that uh, uh, supply chain diversification. India has a huge expectation that uh, Japanese company relocate uh, from China to India. So this initiative itself can benefit them. So of course, I'm not saying that they are joining uh, tomorrow kind of things, but there is room for them to reconsider their position. And India is again a democratic country and a huge potential, and it's very important, I think. Does anyone else want to add to that? I think that was a pretty um, clear answer. Yeah, I would just say real quick that I I hope the timeline for India joining would be you know much sooner rather than later. And just the events of the the past couple months, I think, is showing that that India is is much more open to the idea of, of joining a grouping like this. You know, if you look at um, their relationship with the Quad, for example, that, that's becoming a lot closer. So in fact, it might be that once discussions on creating this type of technology alliance start in earnest, that, that India does want to have a seat at the table from day one, w which I think would be a fantastic outcome. Yeah. Um, so we are close to finishing here, but I don't think this conversation would be complete unless we, um, you know, had at least uh, a short conversation to wrap things up um, that focuses on China. So I want to I want to read something from the report. You guys write the Chinese government is undertaking a systematic and multi pronged effort to access and acquire cutting edge foreign technology through legal and illicit channels. The scale of the challenge warrants a coordinated response. 
Um, you guys then go on, however, to say that you're not proposing decoupling or even partial decoupling. Um, but I'm curious, particularly when it comes to the military civilian fusion strategy um, of the Chinese party, uh, are there even any areas in the technology space where you think that a technology alliance could indeed work with China? Or is this effort um, just essentially to compete with China? Maybe I can take this one. Um, on your, the first part of your question, um, I think, um, so China is definitely a big topic in the report. It does come up, especially when it comes to technology protection, as you mentioned. Um, I think an easy, relatively easy place to start would be better information sharing, because we're seeing a lot of gaps in terms of um, how democracies uh, face the China challenge. Um, specifically on technology protection, um, simply there isn't enough information sharing on this uh, sophisticated technology transfer architecture that China has. We're talking about um, FDI, so acquisitions of, of technology companies, and Europe is definitely um, very affected uh, by this. We're talking about um, research and innovation partnerships with universities, um, and in some cases, Chinese actors really exploit the openness of the innovation ecosystem in, in liberal democracies, but without information sharing about, for example, risky partners and how certain technology are used in China, so end users of the technology, I think we cannot have a, an effective response. So that's why we think um, simply by having this group sharing information, sharing databases about risky partners and how to, how to navigate that entanglement with with China and its innovation ecosystem, uh, the Tech Alliance will be able to really to really um, tackle this. Um, maybe Aniki wanted to add something or Shin. Um, Rebecca, I would just echo everything you just said. And I think um, in, in terms of information sharing, um, it's especially important um, because there are a lot of country neutral approaches you can use to mitigating technology theft um, that I think are essential for uh, maintaining interoperability between research ecosystems, you know, whether that's universities um, and so on and so forth. So I think the more that we can build consensus around this issue, um, the more we'll be able to sustainably have a sort of common approach um, to managing the situation. Uh, Shin, it looks like you're muted. Oh, are you back? Can you hear me right now? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, one thing is that uh, total decoupling is not good uh, in a uh, way because that will weaken economy. So, of course, that uh, economic security, uh, national uh, economic security, national security, but the weakening the economy will not support good, uh, I mean, national security. So, decoupling is a way uh, which weaken economies. Therefore, we have to be very selective about how we are going to protect technology. Of course, there is a critical uh, techno technology and how, how to define critical technology and the common understanding with this definition, definition is very important. But uh, my opinion is that, uh, I mean, uh, complete decoupling is uh, against, uh, I mean, the, the benefit of democratic countries. Awesome. Um, well, I think we have officially gone um, past our allotted time here. I want to thank everyone who tuned in and watched, um, and I'm really hoping uh, that we can come back and hear an update from the authors as you guys, you know, get more input from folks on this um, final report, which I know has been, you know, a lot of sweat and tears put into it. So um, I appreciate that you guys asked me to moderate the conversation. Um, I can take no credit for the work you guys have done. So thank you all. Um, and with that, I want to uh, conclude the event. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you so much, Kylie. Uh, this was a great discussion. Uh, thank you to our viewers for all your great questions. Um, I do want to take a moment and acknowledge a few people. That this event would not have been possible without the hard work behind the scenes uh, by my colleagues, Shai Corman, Jasmine Butler, Chris Estep, Cole Stevens, Melody Cook, Megan Lamberth, and JJ Zhang. Of course, I want to thank our speakers very, very much. Marietje Schake, Richard Fontaine, Akira Amari, 
and Kylie Atwood, and of course my partners on this project, Rebecca Arcasati, Shin Oya, and Ainiki Rikkonen. Uh, work on the Technology Alliance project will continue into the new year. Uh, we're, we're looking forward to ongoing engagement with stakeholders in government, industry, and civil society around the world. Thank you for joining us today. Be well, be safe, and see you next time.